get to start an amazing series leading up to Easter, uh, Not Ashamed, and we're so excited about that. Um, and so we're going to go to Romans 1, 16 and 17. This is the key verse, the key text that we'll be focusing on next week. I really want to encourage you, don't miss next week. My dad will continue on the series talking about how, how the gospel breaks off shame in our life. Um, super powerful, going to be fantastic. But today I get to focus on the greatest message that has ever been given, which is the gospel. So I'm super pumped to preach on it. So we're going to go Romans 1, 16 and 17. Here we go. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. Say to everyone. To everyone. everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, I want to encourage us as we go through the series, read through the entirety of the book of Romans if you can in this month. If you can do it multiple times, do it multiple times, um, because we want to partner with you and that we want this, the, the truth of this book and of the Bible to emanate from our lives. And so we want to encourage you to be reading the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is a masterpiece written by the Apostle Paul. In fact, it's a legal document. It's a, it's Paul's like legal dissertation of how we are made Made right with God, how we become righteous, how are we justified? And it's this incredibly amazing, profound book that Paul wrote. It's his masterpiece, it's his manifesto, and it's written to the church in Rome. And so the book of Romans is broken up into four sections. The first one is Romans 1 through 3, which is righteousness required. And he makes this case in the first three chapters that we all need righteousness, that we're not all righteous on our own selves. We cannot become righteous on our own effort but we need righteousness. And then he goes into Romans 4 through 8 is how do we receive righteousness? So once I realize I need it, how do I get it? How do I get this righteousness that I so badly need? And it's by grace through faith. It's not by our own efforts or our own works, but it's through the work of Jesus Christ. Then he goes into Romans 9 through 11 and it's righteousness in the people of God and how God can bring a people groups together and make us one people group under the name of Jesus. And then he gets into righteousness revealed, chapters 12 through 16 is how does righteous look in our lives? So if we are made righteous and if we are saved, how will it look in our everyday living, breathing, eating, interacting with people? How will righteousness reveal itself in our lives? It's a masterpiece. But if you were to contain the entirety of the book, you could contain it into these two verses. This is the thesis of the book. This is him summarizing what he's about to do for the next 15 chapters post this. He's saying this is, this is it. This is the, the definition of what he's trying to get across. And he says that for I am not ashamed of the gospel. We've heard, that we've heard of the gospel. We've heard of it many times because it is the message that we preach. It's the gospel message. Uh, this is the word they say. It's, it, this is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it has the power to bring about salvation. And so the gospel, this word is used 134 times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word evangelion, which simply means this. It's, it's really, really profound. It means good news. Good news, good tidings. In fact, it wasn't like a, a, like a spiritual term. It was a term from the world. Um, it was, they, would, they would bring the good news if there was a victory on the battlefield. Someone would come back and tell of the victory that was won or the birth of an heir to a, to a king. They would come back and they would say, hey, we have an heir to the throne. This was good news. And this news, when they would come, it would be so powerful because it would affect the entirety of the people group. And so they take this word and he, bring, he begins to use it in such a way that it is, hey, it's not just a victory on a physical battlefield. It's not just a the birth of a physical heir, but there is someone, and his name is Jesus. He is the heir to the throne who sits at the right hand of the Father, and he brought victory over death, hell, and the grave. This is the good news. In chapter 1, Paul talks about the good news three different times. In chapter 1, verse 1, he says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So this is what he, this, the message of Jesus is what distinguishes Paul. He had, he had his, his mission as an apostle, but he was set apart for the gospel. It is this message that distinguishes you and I. It is actually what separates us. It what makes us different. This is the message of Jesus Christ. It's not the same as any ever, every other message in every other religion. This is what distinguishes us, is that we have Jesus. 
Jesus is what makes us a unique religion. It's what, there's nobody like him. Nobody came, no God came and died for their sins. No God was resurrected like Jesus. Jesus is what distinguishes us. The gospel is what sets us apart. It distinguishes us. Then we see in Romans 1.15, he says this. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So this is the message that he's pumped to preach. Aren't you glad that when people preach, they're pumped to preach? Wouldn't it be bad if I came up here and was like, guys, I really don't want to preach today. You guys would be like, why am I here? You know, this sucks, right? That's not, he was pumped to preach it. But Jeremiah says this, he says, it's a fire shut up in his bones. This is what Paul was so excited to preach. He had, he wrote a letter to people that he had never met yet. He wrote a letter to the church in Rome and he's saying, I cannot wait to come. I'm praying to come and I'm ready to preach when I come. And I'm going to preach not just any message, but I'm going to preach the message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then we see that Romans 1 16 says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power, say power, power for God, for salvation to everyone. Say everyone. This message has two components. Number one, it's powerful. And number two, it's available. Okay, so the, the, the gospel of Jesus is powerful and it's available to everyone. Um, oftentimes we, we, we kind of try to do one or the other. So either we make it so available, but then there's, but we, there's no power in it. There's no required to repent. You don't have to do it. It's just, it's anyone, everyone and anyone can have it. It's for everyone. Now it is for everyone, but there's power in it. Or we go on the other side that it's powerful that it will change your life, but it's not for everyone because you have to have it all in order and you have to do it right. And so, yes, it's powerful for some, but it's not available to all. No, see, the gospel is both. God doesn't live in our either ors. He has the tension of both and, and he says, it's both powerful and it's available. So everyone who can believe in it can be also set free by it. It is the message of God that is both powerful and it is available. And so this is the question that we should be asking. What is the good news? What is the gospel? I think if we took a poll in this room, we would have surprisingly many different answers to that question. What is the gospel? What is the good news? What is our message? We should probably know that, right? We're Christians, we're believers. We should probably know what our message is. What is the good news? So the, the, the gospel really has three components, and we're going to break these three components down today. Number one is the bad news. So sorry, don't worry, we won't stop there though, but there's bad news, okay? And, and, and we'll, we'll label that as there's a problem, okay? So if, if there's no problem, there's no need to solve the problem, right? If there's no bad news, then what's the point of having good news? Um, and then the next thing is we see the good news and the penalty that is paid, and then the good news and the power. So there's three components. There's, there's, there's a problem, there's a penalty that's paid, and there's power that's given. Okay. There's a problem, there's a penalty that's paid, and there is power that is given. We're going to start with the bad news. How many of you, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I've got good news or bad news, which one do you want to hear first? How many of you say good news? Okay. You guys are optimists. You guys are awesome. We all need to hang out with them. I'm kind of like, give me the bad news. Just, you know, because if I'm hearing the good news while I know there's going to be bad news, I'm not even hearing the good news. I'm like, just tell me what you don't like about me or whatever it is. I don't know. Right? So if, you're, I, if we're in this conversation, get, hit me with the bad news. Why? Because when I hear the good news, there's going to be a lot more relief, right? I'm like, oh, thank God. Like, praise the Lord. So this is the bad news. I, guys, don't get mad at me. We're going to read scripture. Is that okay? And we're going to allow scripture to give us a little bit of bad news, but then it's going to encourage us with some great news. The best news ever. So, so Paul starts Romans 1, 16, 17. He sums up the, the, whole, the whole book. And it's, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we throw those back up? We're going to read these again. Verse 6. Yeah, there it goes. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For in it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. And we're going to go straight into verse 18. Verse 18. Go now. For the wrath of God, oh man, Paul, you had us going. We were pumped. I was pumped. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodly, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by the unrighteousness suppress the truth. So when we read scripture, we should allow scripture to, to just descend. Read it in its entirety, not just the two verses we like. So he starts off, he says, great news. It's amazing news. That it's, and what does he say? The righteousness of God is revealed by faith 
Then he goes into verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed. So there's no good news without bad news. So what's the bad news? Really, if we have no bad news, there's no weight to the good news. You can have good news, but it doesn't going to carry much weight. So what is the bad news? Um, the bad news is this. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And we're not sinners because we cuss somebody out on the highway. Uh, we're not sinners because we sinned. We are sinners because we're born into sin. And, and we have, it's not that we're just bad people trying to be good. The problem is we have no way of being good on our own. See, see this is what we think and understand. It's like when we, we, if we're just trying to outweigh our good deeds with our bad deeds, eventually the scale is going to be tipped not in our favor. We will not be able to outweigh our bad deeds with our good deeds. It is a fight that we will lose. We're not sinners just because we sinned. We sin because we are born into sin. So there's a problem. There's a problem with humanity. And this problem is we can and, and we cannot fix it on our own. And he says this, if the righteousness of God is revealed by faith in verse 17, what does he say? The wrath of God is revealed from unbelief or the rejection of this message. So if, if righteousness is revealed in faith and acceptance of this message, then the wrath of God is, is, is revealed in the rejection of this message. And there's really two types of wrath that we see in Romans chapter, or in the book of Romans. I, I promise you it will get more encouraging, okay? So everyone just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. So we see the passive wrath of God and we see the active wrath of God. So Romans chapter one is the passive wrath of God which is simply this. It's God giving us up to our own devices. It's God letting us be God. Let me put it another way. Like imagine if I got to the altar and Nancy had no choice in the matter. She just had to marry me. That would suck for me and her, right? It's like, hey, I just have to be here, okay? So let's just do this thing, right? That's not fun, right? Love requires what? A choice. That's what true love is. So God gives us a choice. He died on the cross for our sins. He died for all of us and he gives us a choice and he allows us to make that decision. So the passive wrath of God as, as he goes on in Romans chapter one is him giving us up to our debased mind or giving us up to our own thinking. He allows us to make us God. That's what he talks about. You, you, you suppress the truth for a lie. You begin to worship creation rather than the creator. So this is the problem. What is the passive wrath of God? It's God allowing us to be our own God. He said, okay, if that's what you want, I'm going to allow you to do that. I'm going to give you up to what you want. That's scary. Because I know that if I'm in charge, uh-oh. And that's what he's saying. I'll give you up. And it's not God being indifferent, but it's God being holy and true, okay? So we like to sometimes separate the love of God from the wrath of God, okay? So if God, God just loves us so much, he does. He does love you so much. But if I say I love my kids, but I don't hate the things that could destroy them, do I really love them? No, not really. Like I have a feeling towards them, but if I'm okay with them, and now any parent or anybody in the room is, it, you want to control those things, don't you? But there comes a time you have to let them go and say, okay, make a decision on your own. But with love comes wrath and with wrath comes love. Why? Because God's holy and God is true. And God, so God hates the things that destroys his people. Hates the things that destroys creation. In fact, creation itself is groaning for God to come back. Why? Because he has left us up to our own devices in order, and we continually choose ourselves over him. So the passive wrath of God is God saying, okay, the message is available to everyone. It's available and it's powerful, but there has to be a response on your end. And so I will allow you to do you, boo-boo, okay? Okay. And, and sometimes that's what we want, isn't it? I just wish God would let me do what he, he does. Feel free. But there is something on the other side of that as well. And so that's why it's revealed in unbelief. Because what is unbelief? It's saying, I am going to be God. You are not God. And that's why the wrath is revealed in that. Does that make sense? 
It's revealed when we are our own God and we live in our own way. It's revealed in our marriages. It's revealed in our families. Isn't that how it happens? It's when we put ourselves in the center of our worship, what happens is it is evident that we are our own God. And so why, you know, why is God so mean? Why does he have wrath? Why wasn't he just accept everyone? See, this is the thing. Why do we think, what is hell really? It's life without God. So why would we get to eternity and we've lived a life with, apart from him and then be like, man, I can't wait to live forever with you. That's awesome. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the finality of a decision of saying, you know what? I always was my own God and lived apart from you. So I'm going to do the same in eternity. So this is the passive wrath of God. But then there's the active wrath. Romans 2, 4 through 5 says this. Or do you not presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to what? Repentance. So what does he say here? You presume because God is kind. So God is kind. He's letting us know. His forbearance, which means he's kind of delaying the punishment, right? His patience, which is God's patient. God is loving. God, he gives us ample opportunity to choose them. Does that make sense? That's what this verse is saying. But he's saying, don't presume, though, that God doesn't want you to repent because he's kind of delaying it. Does that make sense? That's what he does, is he, don't presume that because his kindness is meant to lead to what? Repentance, which is a change of thinking. Verse 5, because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So the active wrath of God is saved up for the finality of human history, that at one point, the wrath that was poured out on Jesus on the cross will be transferred back to those who have rejected that message. And there's, why is God, why is God waiting so long to return? Because he's patient, he's forbearing, he's kind. He wants as many people as possible to respond in faith. That is why God is like, it's not gonna happen. You know, we're like, we just need Jesus to return. No, I want him to be as patient as he needs to be so more people can receive the loving kindness of Jesus Christ. And he's delaying it and he's delaying. He's like, okay, we're pushing it off, we're pushing it off. Why? Because he's saying, I want you to turn to me because eventually the, the, the act of wrath of God will be taken off Jesus and to put on to anyone who rejects Jesus. Guys, I didn't write it. It's in the Bible. So if you're mad at me, email the Apostle Paul. Okay. <laughs> but don't worry, there's good news. Romans 3.23, look at this. He levels the playing field. He says this, for all, say all. What does that mean? Everybody. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he says in Romans 1, he goes on about the Gentiles, man, these crazy Gentiles. They didn't know God, and they lived as if they didn't know God. And then he goes into chapter 2, and he's talking about the Jews. Why? Because the Jews are thinking, man, see, Paul, we told you, they're crazy. <laughs> they live for themselves. And he, this is the church people, right? They had the word of God. Oh, church people, we think Romans only applies to people who don't go to church. <laughs> No, Romans 1, he's like, yeah, you guys gave your, but then he goes to Romans 2 and he's like, hey, uh, you guys have your own self-righteousness because the thing is this, you actually had the Bible. You had the law and you still broke it. Ooh. And then he goes to Romans 3, 23, and he's saying, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So he levels the playing field. He's saying, hey, we are all on the same team. We need Jesus. Whether you knew nothing about God and you've never even heard about God, he says creation is a general revelation. You can know there's a God by looking at creation. He's like, maybe you have known God and you had the scriptures. He says, conscience is your general revelation. You know the fact that you have a law. There must be a lawgiver. There's someone who's interacting in this universe. We are all without excuse. None of us are better than one or the other. We all have to make a decision for ourselves. Will I accept the good news of Jesus Christ? See, my dad can't make that decision decision for me and a pastor can't make that decision for me and a grandmother or that we all individually have to make a decision for ourselves and see sometimes what we do is what we try to do is we try to blame why we are the way that we are on somebody else but in all reality we will one day face Christ only with us and he knows the pain and the struggle and the hurt that we went through but we are responsible to how we responded and he's gonna look at us and he's gonna say, hey, okay, did you respond to the message? I offered you a way out. 
That's why I love to wrestle. Because if I lost, I could turn around and be like, it was your fault. But guess what? No, it wasn't. Because I was the one on the mat. Even if my teammate was a horrible teammate and they didn't practice right and I wasn't prepared, who is ultimately responsible? Me. And so Romans 3.23 brings the responsibility to every individual that we have the opportunity to realize, number one, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, that there is a problem and God can leave me up to my own devices, but that may not be what's best for me. God wants to transform and set us free. He wants to deliver us. He wants to heal us. He wants to make us new. This is the message of the gospel. And he's saying it's available to you. And then he says, Romans 5, 8 through 9, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says this, but God shows us his love for us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And most of us stop there. Yeah, woo, 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 woo. That verse is dope. Verse 9 says this, it gets even better. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. If you think that God is mad at you, you have it mistaken. Because if he died for you while you were your own God and we were giving ourselves up to our own devices, how much more when you receive his message is that wrath now not uh, put on us, but it's given away and we receive the love of God. How much more should we understand if I've been justified by Jesus, then he's not angry with me and he's, 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 so patient and he's so forbearing that he's pushing this off and pushing this off. Why? Because his desire is that he died for us even without a promise that we would receive him. That's how good our God is. God gave us a promise of life, but we never gave him a promise back that we would receive it. And he gave his life. That verse is so powerful. That's the big, that is the good news, isn't it? that Jesus died, and it says this right here, that we've been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So the first part of the good news is this, is that we have to deal with the penalty of sin. So if there's a problem, there must be a penalty. And it says this, the wages of sin is what? Death. So there was a death that was required and Christ went on the cross, he died and his blood is what justifies us, which means this, just as if I never sinned. Okay, so we have a report card in our life. Doesn't matter how hard we try and do, we have straight F's. We cannot make ourselves right with God because God is perfectly holy. And so justification is not God just giving us, a, 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 you know, forgiving our F's. He gives us his report card, A pluses, while he's looking at Jesus. So we're just as if we never sinned. It is a, a legal declaration of the penalty of sin has been paid. The debt has been paid. So Christ paid a debt he did not owe and because it was a debt that we could not pay. And he paid the debt, he paid the legal penalty and the wages of sin was death. So Christ died on the cross to set us free. This is the gift of grace. It's not by us earning it. He's saying, while you were a sinner, I did this. So it's not that you can somehow earn this. You just have to receive the fact that I have given you grace and I've died for you. The penalty has been paid. The blood has been shed just as if we never sinned. So now we can store up righteousness as we used to store up wrath. Why? Because our God paid the penalty that had to be paid. But the problem is this, most of us stop right there at the gospel message. Jesus, forgive us. Jesus, you forgave me. Jesus, you forgave me. He did forgive you. He did pay the price, but there's more to the gospel. Verse 10 says this, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, say much more. Romans chapter five is the much more chapter. It says it five different times. It's fantastic. So much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Every religious leader has died but only one came back to life. And only one died for the sins of his people. And his name is Jesus. It was the death of Jesus that made us friends with God. 
but it was his resurrection that brings that life into our life. Romans 8 says this, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So the gospel message is not just salvation from hell. It's saving from us. He said, I can save you from you and I can empower you and I can change you and I can transform you and I can renew your mind. And because this is the thing with salvation, we are saved, we are being saved and we will be saved. So it's not a destination. It's not just a one-time prayer. Okay, I'm saved. No, no. How many of you know we are all being saved? We all need the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in our lives, in our thinking, in our parenting, in our marriages, all of it, God, we need you now. So the same time, as much as I needed him then when I was a sinner fallen from him, I need him now because left to my own devices. So that is why we can actually pray a prayer, go to church and yet still not be being saved. It's not just that we're saved, it's that we're being saved and one day we will have the ultimate salvation which is the glorification of Jesus Christ. So we can actually be saved and be going to heaven but have no transformation in our life because we only dealt with the penalty but we didn't realize that the gospel has power. The power of the life of Jesus Christ within us to bring healing, to bring wholeness, to bring, uh, to bring resurrection to the dead dreams and the dead areas of our thinking and our living. God can breathe life onto those areas and say, hey, come to life, because I am the resurrection and the life. Gee, it is the power of the gospel that sets this message apart. Jesus doesn't just save us, but he's so good that he says, I want to actually transform you, empower you, fill you. Man, our God is good. I cannot change me. Have you ever tried? New Year's resolutions are the worst. I'm going to work out every day. Next day passes. Not every day. It's crazy to think that, you know. A month goes by, it's like, okay, I'll work out once a quarter, you know. The power to set us free. He didn't just get us into heaven. His goal was to get heaven into us. He didn't just try to get, he didn't just die so you could spend eternity with him. He wants to bring eternity now to this moment, in this space, in this time to bring healing, to bring wholeness. I once had a conversation with a young adult, which is always a risk. I am a young adult, it's a risk. You have a conversation, it's a risk. Take the risk, if you will. Uh, They were at Free Chapel, they're like, hey, uh, can I have a conversation with you? I wanna know if you guys accept me here. I said, of course. I said, we accept you. Like, no. So he pr- proceeds the conversation. He says, hey, I don't believe that Paul's writings are inspired. I said, well, okay. I don't believe Jesus actually died. I believe it, like you couldn't find the pulse and that he went to a bunch of different places in Asia and that everyone's worshiping the same God. I'm like, it's like I, and I don't believe he resurrected from the dead. And I'm like, hey, bro, we really accept you here. I want you to know that. Because we do. It's not, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. But I'm going to be honest with you. I said, can I be honest with you? He's like, please. I said, this, you're not a Christian. I love you. But you're not a Christian. Why? Why? Is that, am I being harsh? No, it's, we can't just believe any message we want to believe and call it the gospel. I can't define this. I have to allow scripture to define itself. We believe scripture is inspired, all scripture. Peter affirms Paul as an author. So I'm like, okay, strike one. Peter says, this is inspired word of God, what Paul's writing to you. He says that. Okay. So that's internal evidence. Okay. We should accept Paul too. Two, if Jesus didn't die, the penalty wasn't paid. So then you can't be forgiven. And three, if he didn't resurrect, then he's not alive and he's not sitting at the right hand of the Father. See, the gospel is not just what makes us feel good. This is the most important message ever. That it is for everyone and it is powerful, but it must be received by grace through faith. That 
Jesus came and he died on the cross for our sins. Why? Because that was a problem we could not fix is that we were sinners and not because we sinned, but because we were born. And he dealt with that problem, dealt with the penalty, but then he rose from the dead and he gives us power to be transformed and that the righteousness of God should be revealed from faith to faith. Thank you, Romans 1, 17. And the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 4, 24 through 25, this is where it finishes. But for ours also it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. That is the message of Jesus. So when we say believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What are we saying you should believe and confess? Does that, has anyone ever asked that, right? Okay, I'm believing in my heart and confess with my mouth. And I think there's this genuine, like, I, I want it. What are we believing and what are we confessing? That kind of matters, doesn't it? It matters what we believe and what we confess. And what we believe and what we confess is simply that verse right there. I believe in him who sent the one to die, his own son, and that we, he was raised for our justification. So we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we believe that he was raised from the dead on the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And we wait with hopeful anticipation for his return and that we want to bring everybody with us. So why are we not ashamed? Because it is this message, not our self-righteousness, not because we showed up to church or we read our Bible or we prayed and those things are great. It is this message, the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and died for the sins of humanity and says, hey, I will actually push away the wrath of God. I will allow you to choose me or not but I'm going to give of myself whether you choose me or not and if that is the message of the gospel and he wants us to be free what's beautiful is we actually could be in church our whole lives and the gospel should never get old because I should constantly be looking at myself and being like wow Jesus you are so much better than myself and you know what he says you're right Come here, let me help you out. <laughs> you ever get in a fight with your spouse and you're like, oh, I thought it was so righteous. You're not. He's righteous. He's good. He's holy. And this message never gets old. Why? Because we look at the goodness of our God and we're saying, okay, bring me forward. And he says, we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. What is that? Is that we can actually see the righteousness of God in our lives now, living, breathing. We say, okay, because of Jesus, there's a power that can set us free. Because of Jesus, we can be whole. Because of Jesus, our marriage can be healed. Because of Jesus, our family can be restored. Because of Jesus, not because of self-righteousness or effort or just trying to earn it. Because of Jesus.